My name is Brian O'Hagan and I work at the Center for New Media Teaching and Learning at Columbia University. And what I do is I work with teams of educational technologists, software engineers, and designers uh, to work on features that enable us to use online video in new ways. Um, I think the work that we've done here at Columbia has allowed instructors to rethink how they can use online and digital tools in inventive ways that are not just affecting uh, pedagogy, but also what the idea of the classroom experience is. When I think about oral history and the way that oral history materials are now being integrated into the classroom, I like to think of it through the, the eyes of a, of a digital native today, where today the archives are what's available online. So whether it's on YouTube or Vimeo or any other type of online system, uh, what's available to me today on the internet is, is very valuable because I can find it on my own, I can search for it, do a Google search or web search, I can share it with my friends on Facebook. This is key in my eyes because the way that digital materials have been able to flourish almost in contrast to the way that archival materials have been prepared and stored for years in education is that we're at this point where especially through our work here at Columbia we're trying to bridge that we're trying to bring it together so that archival materials stored here in the libraries can become as easily accessible as the digital materials today and when they're available online in a way that's more accessible you can integrate them with new tools that will then allow the materials to be contextualized in ways that we didn't think about before. Yeah, so here at Columbia we've worked with the Columbia Center for Oral History on a number of courses that are related with their department. Uh, what we have at Columbia that was developed by CCMTL, which is my organiza the organization that I work for, is called VITAL. And VITAL is an anagram for Video Interactions for Teaching and Learning. And it's an online tool where instructors can create libra a library of video materials that can then be offered within certain courses. These video materials can be uh, clipped. We, we use the word the term clipping, but what that basically means is you can uh, specify a start time, you can specify an end time, and you can create a selection from a particular piece of video then you can take that selection, you can put it into a, uh, a hypertext online essay so that students can citate video with ease as if they were to citate text from a book. Uh, we've used that within oral history programs here. Uh, we've taken digital materials that have been recorded years ago and digitized them, or we've taken materials that have been produced recently and we put them online in a streaming format or in sometimes a downloadable format so that these materials can be accessible through our vital tool. And this is one of the ways that we've used one of our new media tools to bridge the gap in terms of how, uh, I guess, well, how oral history materials can be brought into the digital age and made usable by digital tools. Well, I'm, digital natives here today are students who have grown up knowing that there's an internet. They've grown up where a web browser or a chat window or a text message has been a part of their daily life. It's been a part of the way that they communicate with everybody. So that's been a big challenge for us at Columbia because what we have uh, also are the people who know about the world before the internet, before text messaging, before chatting, before social networks. And we're trying to serve the student population now by giving them tools that will hopefully integrate with their course life. But more so, we, we really try to focus on faculty because we want to introduce these digital tools to the faculty so that they become accustomed to the online world that, uh, that students use every day. So by introducing online tools into courses that faculty can begin to use and integrate into their curriculum and hopefully their pedagogy, we take the faculty or the digital immigrant and introduce them to the world of the digital native, which is the, the casual undergraduate or graduate student. 
And what's interesting is these grad that graduate students in higher education are becoming teaching assistants. So they work with faculty and instructors to prepare online materials for their fellow students. So we are at this point too where the digital native will soon be the faculty member or, or the instructor. So uh, the introduction of these tools in the classroom is very important so that not, in my eyes, it's not just introducing, well, in my eyes, it's not just introducing digital tools into the classroom, it's also introducing the digital resources that we use in our daily lives into education. It's one thing to build archives of materials that can be accessed online and used by online tools. If you're at a university or if you're in higher education, there's great infrastructure to support that. There are great resources that allow, uh, that allow digital be tools to be used in classrooms. But it's another thing if you want to use these tools and resources outside of higher ed or outside of the institutional setting. I think that's where the idea of open access and open resources really comes into play. Because if we can work with faculty to understand how to, how to add a Creative Commons attribution to something that they've created, or how to get their, their scholarly work as a part of an open access initiative, then that allows these materials to be available to people beyond uh, the university setting and then has the potential to be available to educators in K through 12 or even lifelong learners. So one of the benefits of the age that we live in today is that there are all these awesome online tools that are available for the casual user and to the academic. I think that online video sharing sites like YouTube, they're free, anyone can use it to upload video and share video. It's become a great tool for someone like the oral historian who is out there wanting to uh, capture narratives and host them online and make them available to anyone who wants to, to view it. But there's also a tension too where we also need to be sure that, uh, well, there also, there's a challenge in that we also risk losing the archival aspect. So while some of these tools are very inventive, and they make the process easier for people to use the internet or online tools to integrate, well, to integrate online tools into oral history practices, we're still at this point where we need to be careful about the archival aspect. Like, for example, uh, you can host everything on, say, YouTube, but YouTube is not necessarily integrated with library systems, right? So it's very hard to search them in, in an academic setting. But I think there are people out there today who are trying, trying to think of ways to do that and are making tremendous strides to, to get us there. When I think about tools that are easy to use and easy to use to distribute media itself, I, I try and think of a tool that I would use to, to share something with my own mother, right? Or maybe my brother or my sister. Uh, and my friends, where one, I know it's not going to take a lot of my time to use the tool, but also I know that the tool provides me with the right features that I can distribute it online in easy ways, right? So uh, any tool that allows you to host media online and then share it, whether through a simple uh, URL or through a Facebook share or a Twitter share, like these are the types of tools that have the potential to really change the way that researchers, whether you're an oral historian or other, can use online audio and video in ways that may reshape how we share digitized materials for scholarly reasons. So tools, you know, again, I, I don't wanna harp on the specifics, but like YouTube, you know, or uh, there have been great initiatives through Apple with iTunes U, where they've created portals where institutions can, uh, they've created portals where institutions can host and then publish educational media materials that are available through uh, not just web applications, but uh, mobile applications. So 
there are tools in that regard that make where the technologies of these tools are making it easier for people to share media online. I feel that the right solutions for educators to be interested in are going to be the ones that have these online sharing capabilities and social capabilities that will uh, make their jobs easier to, sh to just uh, get everybody who, are, who is also working in these fields to be able to share the materials as well. So in, ed in education, typically we've had to invest infrastructure locally on the campus to support technology needs. One of them might be, say, uh, an, a web video streaming server where you can host media materials and stream them to different locations. But this is, in the past, it's also created a bottleneck when students and faculty and administrators want to use that streaming server to get media materials out to, the, to friends or to, to colleagues or to the world. Uh, what's interesting about where we are today is that there are a number of self-hosted solutions that are available through many uh, uh, product manufacturers or open source initiatives online like blogs or wikis or online video sharing sites or social networks where these can become resources in place of the local infrastructure or in most cases in tandem with the local in infrastructure as well. So you could definitely see a situation where in the past we might have a student who is creating a video to be used in her class and in the past she might have to go through a certain number of steps to work with an instructor or a teaching assistant or a local administrator to get that video up online so then it can be shared through a class website. Today a lot of those steps are saved if say the, the student she instead records the video on a digital device, loads it onto her computer, uploads it to a web service, maybe it's on Facebook, maybe it's YouTube, or maybe it's her own blog and then she can take that and bring it into the class website or share it through email or share it through a social network with her, her fellow students and the instructor. So the ways in, in which these online solutions for sharing media have, uh, have evolved, it's actually, it's, it's making us who work in technology in academia rethink the types of solutions that can work for the classroom setting.